Uh, Peter Gregerson was with uh, the Watchtower organization for about 50 years. 50 years. So we're certainly glad to have him with us. He's from uh, Gadsden, Alabama. All the years that I can remember that I've been a part of BRC, I've always wanted to give a talk that would help people or encourage people on the road out of the Watchtower to the life as a Christian. This time is different. Uh, I've had some personal experiences that have convinced me that there are many people that have left the Watchtower or are now in the process of leaving the Watchtower and whose lives have gone downhill rather than, than in, improved as a result. And, I've, and in trying to find out about it, I've come to the conclusion that somewhere way down deep inside of them, they have not sought, resolved the problem as to whether it's possible that somehow, some way, the Watchtower Society could be, maybe is, God's only organization. And that, that's hung inside of them, and it's affected their attitudes toward life in so many different ways. And so, what I'm going to do is ask you, please, to understand that this presentation is not for you. At least, very likely, is not for you. Uh, but you have a responsibility to help other people. And I would l this is going to be difficult for me because I'm going to read this thing to you. But it's going to be difficult for you because what I'd like for you to do is put, get out of your shoes and get inside of somebody that you know that is in the condition that I've just described, that is uncertain, confused, whose attitude toward life is not what it ought to be. And could it be because they've not resolved this issue? Put yourself in their shoes and then listen to this and ask yourself, would a copy of this be of some value to them? It's simply an effort on my part to help some people in the local area and hopefully if it's of any value for Maryland. And I'll tell you this, I, I, I need corrections. I need additions. I need help in making this booklet what it can be. So I'm wide open to you to give me some help. I just had a few of these printed. I'll have more printed if, if they're going to be of any value. <clears throat> My talk today is directed to anyone who's left the Watchtower. How many people are in this group? The Free Minds Journal has recently published estimates. For example, in 2006, they estimated 42,846 were disfellowshipped and did not return to the Watchtower Society. They also estimate there were 38,805 others that year who quietly faded out and became permanently inactive. The total number for these two groups for the last 10 years comes to 1,017,062. If you're one of those 1 million ex Jehovah's Witnesses, this message is for you. I want you to have the freedom I've found, freedom from worry and fear, from wondering whether you've made a terrible mistake and that you'll suffer the consequences. I want you, too, to be able to look at life with new eyes, to, to live your life fully as a follower of Christ Jesus, free from any negative influence, to live with peace in your heart. First, I think especially those who, like me, grew up in the Watchtower, in their culture, with their, and they're with their lives saturated with Watchtower beliefs. To these, I suggest that the Watchtower's influence may still remain in your life in a powerful and negative way. If you're one of those one million people, you may say, I'm out, thank you, it's a closed chapter in my life, it's over and done, I'm free of all that. But please take a minute and consider this. Jesus himself, in answering the question of gaining eternal life, made it very plain that we must be active, loving neighbors as a good Samaritan to those in trouble. He said that in the judgment day, your compassionate service for the sick and the poor would be decisive in getting his blessing. How much time, energy, and money do you expend in such Christian service? As you think of your own life pattern, what do you think is the root of your attitude toward the world's suffering? When was your mind programmed with that attitude? 
Again, Jesus himself plainly said that God loved the world so much that he asked his son to come to earth not to critically condemn the world to destruction, but as he says, that the world may be saved through him. We know that the Bible says not to be corrupted or polluted by the world. But do you love the world that God loves, the world that Jesus Christ loved and died for? Honestly, where and when was your mind programmed with your attitude toward the world of mankind? Is there a church or community of Christians that you're actively involved with so that as part of the kingdom yeast, you have a part in changing the bread dough, the world, as Jesus foretold? To be the salt or the yeast of the world means your active involvement in it, doesn't it? Now, these are just some questions intended to help you as you look at yourself and ask, why do I think the way I do? Could the Watchtower mind programming still be in my system, negatively affecting the success of my life? Question, are you one who thinks deep in his heart that it's just possible that the Watchtower just could be the one and only true organization of God. Do you remember the idea that the Watchtower is the faithful slave to whom has been given all, yes, all of Christ's belongings? That means, of course, that all others have none. So all other worship, all other good works of charity are the works of Satan's Babylonish hypocrites, evil money grubbers, all disapproved by Jehovah and true Christians. Let us once and for all, today, methodically and honestly, go to the very core of the watchtower and its one basic claim about itself. I invite you to share my experience as I examine the one watchtower claim about itself upon which all else is built, that the watchtower is the faithful slave, the one and only organization to whom all of Christ's belongings are given. Is it the one and only organization of God? Or is it a grand fraud? Is there, any ter is there a terrible lie upon which this huge organization has been built with its culture and attitudes? Let's begin our search. First, I think it's important for you to know that I have no hurtful motive in discussing this with you. I'm not speaking out of spite or anger. Until the day I left the watchtower, I had never been reproved, disciplined, or disfellowshipped. I was never in any trouble with them. I have no personal enemies in the watchtower. What was my life experience as a, as a witness? For almost 50 years, I was a regular pine, a publisher or a pioneer. At 21, I served as a congregation overseer in Dixon, Illinois, then was sent by the society as the overseer to Peoria, Illinois. Then I was sent as the overseer to handle some trouble in Davenport, Iowa. Later, I served as the overseer of the Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, and then I served as an overseer in two congregations in Gadsden, Alabama. I served as a circuit assembly servant, had various administrative titles in larger conventions, including Yankee Stadium. I taught the elder school in the northern half of Alabama. It may give you some insight if, if I read to you a few passages from several confidential letters from the Watchtower headquarters to me. The full copies are available. <clears throat> Quote, we're grateful for you responding to our confidential inquiries. Your observations already have been of considerable aid. You've written so helpfully to the society. You are regarded as one of the gifts and men by us. Another letter. This society is writing you confidentially. We're interested in your observations on vital matters. This is completely confidential. Another. It was a pleasure to have you in attendance at the recent meeting with members of the teaching committee of the governing body. Another. The society is looking for stories for publications involving brothers who successfully raised families in the truth. You've successfully raised a fine family of seven children. Your wife has been an excellent example also. Another letter. This to be kept confidential. We are particularly interested in your observations on so and so. And like many of you, I had a lifetime of witness friends. I love them still and look forward someday to being close friends again. My children were all witnesses, all mar had married into witness families. My dad and mother were witnesses. My dad was of the anointed and a, and a regional legend. My brothers and sisters were witnesses. My life was completely wrapped up in being a good witness. I was told that I had a bright future. I had respect, admiration, reputation in the organization until the day I left. 
when I decided to leave, I wrote a letter of resignation, then called the Bethel headquarters to tell them of my decision. I talked with an old friend, David Olson, an overseer in the service department. His response was, I hate to see you go. We love you, he said, and I hope that you'll soon be back. If you do, there'll be many blessings in your future. So you might ask, why would you leave the watchtower? This is what I want to tell you about today. The answer hangs on one question. Is the Watchtower the only true organization of God? So many of life's attitudes depend on this, for me and for you. As you've all noticed, in 1975, Armageddon didn't come. In the fall of 76, the governing body decided they had a serious problem with meeting attendance and all features of the work. They called a special meeting with select men from around the U.S. to confidentially discuss what to do. The chairman of the governing body then, Milton Henschel, told us that this was the only such meeting ever called in the history of the Watchtower. You are our gifts and men, so please speak absolutely, openly, and frankly. That was one ex with one exception, no discussion of 75, <laughs> for obvious reasons. <laughs> one session was on our judicial system. It was an eye-opener. I knew we had problems with injustice with some of the elders in Gadsden. Alabama, but I thought it was just a local problem. However, three-fourths of those men from around the U.S. had heartbreaking stories to tell of injustice. It appeared to me to be everywhere. Why, I thought, did the faithful slave under the direction of God's Holy Spirit allow this? In the months that followed, sometimes I'd wake up in the night and I'd have several things to worry about. Well, here's one of them. My son David drives too fast. <clears throat> Janet thinks he learned that from his father. Um, what would I do if someday David's family was in an automobile accident and his son, my grandson, David John, had to have a blood transfusion or he would die? Then in my mind at night, David comes to me and he says, Dad, please, please prove to me, prove to me that the watchtower is the faithful slave so that I can follow their instructions and say goodbye to my son and let him die. I realized that in my 50 years, I had never really done my homework. I decided to take some time off from my business and do the research in order to be at peace with myself and to support my family if some trouble did happen. Did I really want to prove the watchtower to be the faithful slave? Oh, yes. I remember making a deal with myself as I started my research. If at the end I still had a lingering doubt, I would stay. If there was even one chance in a hundred, even more, I would stay. I was comfortable. I had invested 50 years of my life in friendships that were very important to me. On the other hand, I had a prayer that I'd learned from my dad as a little boy. Jehovah, I will follow the truth wherever it leads, whatever the cost. I'd lived with that prayer and my understanding of truth all my life. It had given me courage through lots of tough times. The first time that I can remember was way back as a 10-year-old boy, fifth grade, in, in a new school, Franklin School in Clinton, Iowa. The teacher demanded that I salute the flag and stood me before our class, and she ridiculed me every day of that year. That was the longest year of my life. So I'd faced some serious issues throughout my life. This one was really serious. I had a big family that I felt a big responsibility for. I had two guiding thoughts. First, there is no benefit in self-deception, truth above all. I might leave, but only if there was absolutely incontrovertible proof. I prayed so many times, Jehovah God, please help me find the truth. And so began my search for truth. Now, it may seem strange to some, but the claim of the watchtower to be the faithful and discreet slave is quite simple. Actually, it comes down to three verses in the Bible. Three verses. Let me tell you where I stand. If those three verses are a prophecy, and if they are correctly interpreted by the watchtower, and if their interpretation is corroborated by the facts, then the watchtower is the faithful slave and all that goes with it. If so, they are the one and only true organization of God, period. Now, those three verses are found in Matthew 24 as well as repeated in Luke 12. Please turn, uh, and we'll just keep on reading here, First Matthew 24, 45. 
says, quote, Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find him so doing. Assuredly, I say to you, he'll make him ruler over all his goods. And now if you turn to Luke 12, you'll find the same words. Both accounts have Jesus continuing to say that if the servant says in his heart that the master delays his coming and begins to beat the other servants, then when he does return, the master will deal severely with that servant. Jesus sums this whole thing up in verse 48 of Luke 12. Quote, For everyone to whom much is given from him, much will be required. And to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask the more. Now, the question for you and me, is this really a prophecy? For 50 years, I'd always looked at it as a prophecy. I didn't realize that other Bible students and scholars see it just as another teaching parable by Jesus, emphasizing the need of faithfulness by those having teaching responsibilities. But the Watchtower sees those three verses as a prophecy about themselves and for our time. So was it or wasn't it a prophecy? With no way for me to prove it one way or the other, I was willing to grant them that it was possible. In a nutshell, the Watchtower teaches that the Master, Jehovah, Jesus Christ, turned their attention to the earth in judgment in 1918 and 1919, and as a result, the Watchtower was awarded the blessing as the faithful slave. The Watchtower believes that they had served as a slave before that, but in 1919, the final decision was made. Again, I was willing to go along and accept 1918 and 1919 as the window of judgment. Now, and here is the bedrock question for our discussion today. On what basis did Jehovah God, Jesus Christ, make such a decision? The Watchtower answer is very straightforward. Let me read you a few excerpts out of many I found, and I'm going to read you the words word for word from their literature. From You May Survive Armageddon into God's New World, page 207, quote, In the spring of 1918, he came to the spiritual temple for judgment work. That judgment started with those who are obedient to the good news of God, namely the remnant of the temple stones, the remnant of the 144,000 spiritual Israelites. By serving the spiritual food of God's message to the spiritually hungry, the Lord entrusted to them his belongings on earth. Let's fill out the picture just a little more. On page 352 and 3 of God's kingdom of a thousand years is approached. We read, quote, In the year 1919, Jehovah did turn his hand back upon those who are insignificant. Like the slave's master in the illustration, the Lord Jesus did return to his house, inspect the situation within it. He did find there a faithful and discreet slave class that was striving in spite of the world conditions to do as commanded, give the Lord's domestics at the proper time their spiritual food, food taken from the inspired word of God. So the Lord showed his favor by regathering them into a well-organized body of domestics in his house. The eight-day general convention held in Cedar Point, Ohio on September 1 to 8, 1919 was a notification to all the world that the invisibly present Lord Jesus Christ was regathering his faithful sheep. It indicated to the world who it was that the returned Lord Jesus had found to be his faithful and discreet slave class. This made the slave class happy, end of quote. Now someone could say, Peter, that's just about their serving spiritual food. How is that the basis for their being the only true religion? On what basis do they have, do they have the authority to punish people who break one of their rules, like on tobacco or celebrating holidays or even in my case, eating with an employer or with Ray Franz who left the watchtower. They can demand that a person not be allowed to eat with or even speak to someone they want punished. And if the watchtower turns their back on you, they say that God does too. Disfellowshipping is the same as a death sentence. Where does the authority from that power and that power come from? Indeed. What is the basis for their claim to be the one and only organization of God? The Watchtower would answer, good question. I'm glad you asked. Here's the answer. The Watchtower, December 15, 1977, page 751 says, quote, 
their faithfulness and spiritual wisdom in the master's service determines their worthiness to be put in charge of all the earthly belongings of their master. Now, there are a couple of very important points here. First, it is the watchtower's faithfulness and spiritual wisdom that determines their being put in charge of all his belongings. We're going to look for that in just a few minutes when we examine the evidence. Secondly, and very importantly, those three words, all his belongings. What does that mean to you? For sure, if someone has all of someone belonging, then others have nothing. So we know of the belief that everyone who are not of the watchtower are disapproved by God and so will be destroyed at Armageddon. 99.9 .9 of all humans, all churches, all charities, everyone. Only watchtower people survive. But those three words mean much more than that. Those three words, all his belongings, are at the very bedrock of what the Watchtower Society is. First, <clears throat> let's see what <clears throat> excuse me. Let's see what those three words have come to mean to the governing body itself in Brooklyn. And then secondly, we'll see how that view of themselves affects the way they deal with other witnesses. Those three words explain their power over all witnesses, including you and me, if we're witnesses. Again, I'm going to read from God's Kingdom of a Thousand Years, His Approach, page 356 and 7, and the Watchtower of October 1, 1981, page 28. Quote, All these privileges, responsibilities, dignities, and honors that have been reserved for the, rem for the remnant of the faithful and discreet slave class and that are bestowed upon them by their heavenly father the reigning king jesus christ their being charged with these precious things denotes an elevation of them indeed it resembles the picture presented in revelation 11, 11 and they heard a loud voice out of heaven say to them come on up here and they went up into heaven in the cloud and their enemies beheld them Pictorially speaking, the Almighty God has girded up their loins for the discharge of this weighty ministry by binding upon their hips the sash or the of a steward or a major domo. Further prophesying regarding the modern Eliakim class, Jehovah said, And I will drive him as a peg in a lasting place, and he must become as a throne of glory to the house of his father, and they must hang upon him like upon a peg all the glory of the house of his father. Someone might say, they actually think they've been as though called up to heaven and receiving all the glory? All right, Peter, they very well may think too highly of themselves, but so what? What does their self-glorification mean to me? I can live with that. But please, let me continue. Hear what they're occupying such a grand position does mean to you. Listen, from the same references, quote, They realize that these sheep-like ones out of all nations and tribes and peoples and tongues are a precious part of all his belongings on the earth. Another example is taken from or Organized to Do Jehovah's Will. It repeats this saying on page 16 about the great crowd, They are among the precious belongings of Christ. Did I read that right? The all his belongings includes people. All witnesses have been given by Jesus to the faithful slave. That explains a lot. Again, listen to this, quote, The Eliakim class has become like a father who provides for all those pictured by the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the house of Judah, such a dominion as this, Jehovah by Christ has given into the hand of the steward class, and this composite steward has faithfully and discreetly exercised this dominion till now. Brothers, the word dominion was carefully chosen by the watchtower here and used twice. What does the word dominion mean to you? And especially, what does it mean to them? According to the dictionary, it means supreme authority. Absolute ownership. Supreme authority. Absolute ownership. Someone once told me, those three little words, all his belongings, are the basis for the greatest claim to power ever made in the history of Christianity. 
This is the claim to be the one and only organization of God with ownership, supreme authority over all other Christians. Someone asked me when I talked about this, but does anyone take that seriously? And I thought about that. What do you think? I personally know people at men in the service department, which runs the activity in the United States, who sincerely believe that whatever the faithful slave writes, that becomes law as they in turn instruct the district and circuit overseers, and they in turn enforce it with the elders and the congregations. As to their attitude, I once heard a circuit overseer say, quote, if the faithful slave says this green Bible is black, it is black. You may have heard the same thing. Many of you have, I know. Someone may smile and say, Peter, that's just a cute rhetorical exaggeration. But what do you think? Am I making too much of all this? Please listen carefully to the words of a prominent member of the governing body, Albert Schroeder, when he lectured the Bethel elders on May 29, 1980. Quote, We serve not only Jehovah God, but we are under our mother, the organization. He went on, there are 1,177 rules and regulations. And I ask you, how comprehensive are these rules? How much do they affect our everyday life? I want to read to you just a few examples taken from the branch office correspondence manual as listed in the book, In Search of Christian Freedom, page 242. And I'll just read a couple. Abortion, adoption, alcoholic beverages, Bible study, birth control, birthdays, blood, business partnerships, clothing that's proper, conduct, confessions, dating, divorce, employment, family affairs, gambling, uh, impotence, karate, living accommodations, loans, loose conduct, marriage, medical treatments, music, parents, pants for women, uh, political elections, recreation, schools, sex relations, tobacco, transplanting organs, union membership, voting, weddings, so on. There are over a thousand rules that affect every aspect of life. Are these rules taken seriously by Jehovah's Witnesses? You know and I know. The truth is people like you and me were willing to die for these rules. Let me give you an example. Someone tracked down the changes made by the faithful slave regarding the transfusions of blood fractions. Here are the changes. 1956, certain blood fractions, particularly albumin, the, all came under the scriptural ban. That was in uh, by the Awake, September 8, 56. The prohibition against blood fractions was then reversed allowing it in the Watchtower September 15, 58. Then banned again in the Watchtower of September 1961. Then allowed again in the Watchtower 1961. Then banned again uh, in February 15, 1963. Then partially reversed in August 22, 1965. And then partially and grudgingly allowed for homophiliacs in June 15, 1978. I remember Ed Dunlap, a Bethelite from... Uh, who handled these calls from people, from brothers, with their pleas about blood transfusion, standing in our kitchen and telling the most horrible, terrifying uh, uh, stories about dying witnesses calling in, needing help, wanting instructions. They were going to live or die based on what they were told from Brooklyn. And nowhere, of course, does the Bible say anything about blood fractions. Think about this. If you were willing to forego the simple joy of celebrating your mother's or your dad's birthday or your son's or your daughter's, and if you were programmed in your heart and mind so that we're willing to live by these 1,000 rules, if you were willing to live or die or even kill your children according to them, isn't it just possible that some of that mental programming is still in your attitudes and thinking? This is a very serious matter. It comes down to this. If the Watchtower claim is true and God has given them the authority and the power, who are we to complain if they make mistakes? But on the other hand, if their claim is false, do they not have a terrible responsibility for the heartache caused by their 1,000 rules? Jesus reminds us, quote, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he thrown into the sea. 
At any rate, it's now time to inspect the evidence that will resolve this issue one way or the other for us. As a last reminder, I quote from God's Kingdom of a Thousand Years as Approach, page 350. This book was written by none other than the man who was acknowledged as the teacher of doctrine at the Watchtower for over 60 years, Fred Fran. Here again is the bedrock basis for their claim. Quote, the serving of food, the right sort of food at the proper time was the issue. It had to be according to this that a decision must be re rendered by the return master. The quality of the food itself was to be considered, end of quote. So here it is in a nutshell. In 1918 and 1919, the return master, Jesus, return, turns his attention in judgment of the servant. His blessing depends on the quality of the spiritual food being distributed by them. It's time for us to examine the evidence. Actually, it's not difficult to identify the main spiritual food that was dispensed in 1918 and 1919. In past years, there have been six main books published in a series called Studies in the Scriptures. The last one, though, was published back in 1904. First published. But, Finally, on the 17th day of the 7th month of 1917, the last one, the 7th, was published entitled The Finished Mystery. It was greeted as exciting new light, the latest of the advancing light of truth. It was the only book the Watchtower Society published during this critical time of judgment, 1918-1919. How important was this book judged to be? Acceptance of this book actually became the test of whether you were in the truth or not. And think of this. The Watchtower probably, proudly announced that its distribution was the focus of their activity. They said the distribution of the seventh volume was, quote, unparalleled by the sale of any other book known in the same length of time excepting the Bible. And listen to this. In addition, 10 million copies of a large four-page uh, tabloid-sized tract with excerpts from the book were distributed. And then on March 1, 1918, the whole book was printed as a special edition of the Watchtower, something that had never been done before or after. I need to mention that there was one other big effort made during this 18-month window of judgment in 1918 and 19. It was a campaign of public speeches entitled, The World Has Ended, Millions Now Living Will Never Die. It was not put into print until after the judgment window closed. But because it was a big oral message, we we're going to briefly ex examine that as well. And it only had one main point. Now, from its very beginning, the Finnish mystery itself states how incredibly important its message was. Quote, that at this time, now, when the predicted faithful and wise servant would be present with God's people, the vision would be made plain. And this is very interesting. For the Lord Jesus has pronounced that whatever the Father shall make known to him, to Jesus, he in turn will make known to us. That's an incredible claim. Let me give you quickly some more examples of how important this book was considered to be. On page 256, referring to Revelation 16, 17, the seventh angel is identified as being volume 7 of the studies in the scriptures. That's who the seventh angel is. On page 231, the seven angels are identified as the seven volumes. Furthermore, on page 145, in quoting uh, Revelation 8, 5, that angel is identified as the Watchtower Society through its proper representatives, which took the censor, which is the seventh volume of studies in the scriptures, d quote, divinely provided. And on page 293, it says, And I saw heaven opened. And this is explained as the hidden things of God as recorded in the seventh volume of studies in the scriptures. No question, this was the book, the spiritual food distributed by the faithful slave in 1918-1919. Now, before we finally examine the book itself for its spiritual wisdom and God's message by reading word for word from the pages of the book, I, I have it. Uh, in there. It's important that you've already thought about a, s a certain question, and if you haven't thought about it, let's consider it for a minute. If the spiritual wisdom distributed in 1918 and 1919, as they say, had to be the basis 
for God and Jesus appointing them over all his belonging, including all witnesses, thus making them the only true religion of God, then why is it? Why in my 50 years as a witness had I never read one excerpt or one quotation of this wisdom? You'd think a slave would be so happy and proud of it that they'd be referring to it often. I had seen a picture of the cover of the book several times, but I'd never read one quotation, not one, from its 600 pages. They still proudly refer to it as powerful and of God. But think about this. The Watchtower doesn't even make this book available for you to purchase. You can't buy this wonderful book. It, it's not even available to, for you to look at in a Kingdom Hall library. Why? Why? If they, why had I not been able to read it in 50 years if it was the proof that the Watchtower is the only true organization of God? And I ask you, have you ever read any of it, of the quotes from this book? And you have to ask yourself, are they ashamed of it? Are they ashamed of that book? And did they think it was just going to disappear when they took it out of, out of Kingdom Hall libraries? Um, and, and did they not anticipate the eBay? Uh, they, they, they had a reason for destroying it. Now, let's, let's examine it together, and then you decide that question for yourself. First, there was two quick time predictions I'd like to read you. Quote, also in the year 1918, when God destroys the churches wholesale and the church members by millions, it shall be that any that escape shall come to the works of Pastor Russell. That's page 485. Uh, another quote, Christianity will rejoice at the desolation that will be Christendom's after 1918. Not one vestige of it shall survive the ravage of worldwide all-embracing anarchy in the fall of 1920. That's uh, from page 542. This book is riddled with such prophecies. As in page 69 to 71, there are 88 prophecies claiming Christ's return in 1874, not 1914, and that the last days began in 1799. This reminds me of the prophecy, at, or the, the, the scripture, at Deuteronomy 18:20 to 22, quote, But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded him to say must be put to death. You may say to yourself, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. Now, finally, as to the quality of this spiritual wisdom, here is an example. And I ask you, please, get a copy of the book and read it yourself. But Nahum 2, 3 through 6 is commented on. Quote, Nahum was the next one of the holy prophets, and after prophesying that in the last verse of the preceding chapter about the coming of the king with his good tidings of peace to the sin-burdened earth, he next tells of an interesting thing that will be a matter of common everyday experience at the time the kingdom is established. That he describes a railway train in motion, not an automobile, as some thought. And, but, and if we'll be willing to be, uh, be at the trouble to put ourselves in the prophet's place, we can see just what he saw in his vision and what he has so interestingly described. First, the prophet stands looking at the engine coming toward him and then says, the shield, the thing ahead of the great warrior, the headlight, is made red or it shines brilliantly. The valiant men, the engineer and the fireman are dyed scarlet when the flames from the firebox illuminate the interior of the cab at night as the fireman opens the fire door to throw in the coal. The chariots, the railway coaches, shall be shall be preceded by the locomotives that at night have the appearance of flaming torches in the day of preparation. Next, the prophet takes his place in the train and looks out the window, and seemingly the fur tray shall be sh terribly shaken. That's the telegraph poles alongside the track seem to be fairly dancing. The chariots shall rage in the streets. A, a railway uh, is merely an elaborate, scientifically constructed street or highway, and they shall jostle one another in the broad ways. The clanking and bumping of the cars 
commerce together as one of the significant items of railway travel. They shall seem like torches. A railway train at night rushing through a distant field looks like nothing so much as a vast torch going at flying speed. They shall run like lightnings. Next, the prophet sees the conductor coming for his ticket. And he says, he shall recount his worthy. The conductor spends his entire time almost counting and recounting all his passengers, keeping them checked up. They shall stumble in their walk, try walking on a rapidly moving train. They shall make haste to the wall, thereof to the next city or town. And the cover of the train shed, the station shall be prepared. The baggage man, express man, mail wagon, hotel bus, intending passengers and friends to meet incoming passengers will all be there waiting for the train to come. The gates of the river shall be open. The doors of the cars will be open. And the people will flow out of the palace that's the car, and will be dissolved, and shall be dissolved or emptied. End of quote. I remember the first time I read this, and I thought, this is unbelievable. It must get better. <laughs> but it doesn't. <laughs> it, it, it's worse, really. On page 84 and 85, the behemoth and the leviathan of Job are identified at great length as the steam engine and the railway locomotive. I had expected better than this. Do you remember in Revelation 16 where God's wrath results in blood as high as horses' bridles for a distance of 1,620 furlongs? Let me read you what this means according to this divinely provided book. Quote, this cannot be interpreted to refer to the 2,100-mile battle line of the World War. A furlong or stadium is not a mile, and this is without the city anyhow, whereas the battle line is within the city. A stadium is 606 three-quarter feet, 1,200 137.9 miles. That's what we're looking for. The work on this volume was done in Scranton, PA. As fast as it was completed, it was sent to the Bethel. Half of the work was done at an average distance of five blocks from the Lackawanna State station, the other half at a distance of 25. So blocks in Scranton are 10 to the mile, hence the average distance to the station is 15 blocks or 1.5 miles. The mileage from Scranton to Hoboken Terminal is shown in the timetables as 143.8 miles, and this is the mileage charged to passengers. But in 1911, at an expense of $12 million, the Lackawanna Railroad completed its famous cutoff, saving 11 miles of the distance. From the day the cutoff was completed, the trainmen have been allowed 10, 11 miles less than the timetable shown, or a net distance of 132.8 miles. From the Hoboken Ferry to Barclay Street Ferry, New York, is 2 miles. Barclay Street Ferry to Fulton Ferry, New York is 4,800 feet or 0.9 miles. Fulton Ferry to Fulton Ferry, Brooklyn is 2,000 feet or 0.4 miles. Fulton Ferry, Brooklyn to Bethel is 1,485 feet or three tenths of a mile. So the shortest distance from the place where the wine press was trodden by the feet members of the Lord whose guidance and help alone made this volume possible, it comes out to exactly 137.9 miles. No wonder I had never read even one example of this spiritual wisdom in 50 years. Truly, in their foolish abundance of words, they have built the scaffold for their own demise. Let me go on. The angels from Revelations 14 are identified. Revelations 14, 15 says, and, quote, another angel, the witness to the Lord in the land of Egypt. The Grand Pyramid confirms the Bible's teaching that the time of harvest has come. That was in 1874, as you remember. Then there are 22 measurements of the pyramids to prove it. Revelation 14, 17, another angel is identified as Pastor Russell himself. And then it assumes to identify the woman and her child. And uh, let me give you a few excerpts of this. Quote, it's, you remember the words that say, the woman which was ready to be delivered, and she brought forth a man-child, and that man-child is nothing less than the papacy. And uh, the woman and the, the true church of God fled into the wilderness for a 1,203 score days. That's 1,260 years from 539 to 1799 when the last days started. And then there was, you remember, war in heaven? Michael is identified as the Pope. The book is full of this, full of this spiritual wisdom from God. I'm going to come back to the book for a minute, but let's pause for a change of pace and consider the other spiritual food distributed through the speech, Millions Now Living Will Never Die. And I have a copy of it here at, in, in the room. Uh, it has only one main point, and I'll read it to you from page 97. 
quote, based upon the argument heretofore set forth then that the old order of things, the old world is ending and is therefore passing away and that the new order is coming in and that 1925 shall mark the resurrection of the faithful worthies of old and the beginning of reconstruction, it's reasonable to conclude that millions of people now on the earth will still be on the earth in 1925. Then based upon the promises set forth in the divine word, we must reach the positive and indisputable conclusion that millions now living will never die. And that's from page uh, 97. So I ask you to remember that condemnation of false prophecy that we referred to in Deuteronomy 18. Now back to the spiritual food that was in this finished mystery book and to the question as to why they have never quoted its wisdom. I have a book I don't think, is it in there? I, have a, I brought it along and I may have left it in the room, but I have a copy of the finished mystery and I have marked in it 190 examples of where if you took that into a kingdom hall today, you'd be disfellowshipped. 190 examples out of a 600-page book of things that would get you disfellowshipped if you 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 believed that or tried to talk about it. Time permits only one more example of the evidence. I'm going to read to you a few of the 88 prophecies on page 68 to 71 that prove that Christ returned not in 1914 but in 1874. I can't read them all. That would take too long. But I can encourage you to, to get one of these books. Uh, you can get one on the Internet and then... Uh, but I want to right now read you a few of the prophecies that you might recognize. Quote, Some of the scriptures which prove that the Lord's second advent occurred in the fall of 1874 are as follows. The gospel has been preached in all the world for a witness. The abomination has been seen in the holy place. The flight of the saints from the antitypical Judea has occurred. The great tribulation has commenced. The false witness Christ are with us. The eagles have gathered to the carcass. The sun and moon have been darkened. The man of sin has been revealed. The perilous times and all associated evils are here. The mighty angel has roared. Lord, come out of here, uh, her. The seven last plagues have been poured out. The, the tares and the wheat have been separated. The ambassadors of peace have wept bitterly. The seven uh, seals have been opened. The seven angels have sounded. The nature, nations are angry. The winepress of God's wrath has been trodden. The dumb dogs have failed to bark. The silver has been cast into the streets. The nations have been shaken. The seas and the waves are roaring. The brethren are not in darkness. All others are. The scoffing, the predicted scoffing has taken place. And these are but a few of the 88 of the proofs hastily con uh, collected, end of quote. And that's from page 68. All of this proves, of course, that, that 1874 is when Christ returned. Now, here's the interesting thing. Would you like to know what the physical evidence is that they cite to prove that, or to corroborate these prophecies? I'm just going to read you again a few of them, but uh, I think you'll find it interesting. Revelation 18 is being interpreted, and I want to read again the quote. And after these things, as another view of the harvest epic, I saw another angel, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Some of the glories of the new day discovered since 1874 are adding machines, airplanes, aluminum, antiseptic, surgery, automobiles, barbed wire, bicycles, cash registers, cream separators, disc plows, divine plan of the ages, dynamite, North Pole, Panama Canal, pasteurization, South Pole, submarines, skyscrapers, subways, typewriters, wireless telegraphy. And he cried out mightily with a strong, mighty voice. How apt are these scriptures that refer to Pastor Russell as a voice saying, Babylon the Great is fallen, indicating that at some time a sudden and utter rejection is to come upon Babylon. Such a rejection as we have shown was due in 1874. That's the end of the quote. Think about it. Barbed wire and bicycles are proof of the last days and Christ's return in 1874. This book is God's message of spiritual wisdom. It had to be, to, according to them, it had to be according to this book that a decision must be rendered by Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, the evidence is clear and overwhelming beyond any question or argument. 
In the beginning, I had wanted so much for their claim to be true. I'd been willing to accept those three verses in Matthew 24 and Luke 12 about the faithful slave as prophecy, uh, as, as, as a prophecy, although common sense said it was a teaching parable by Jesus. I had accepted their stated basis for judgment, the spiritual food they distributed in 1918 and 1919. I had been led to expect some beautiful quality spiritual food that would mightily impress God and Jesus. As to its spiritual quality, I think you'll agree it proves pathetic to the point of silliness shameful silliness an insult to common intelligence and most certainly an insult to god himself and our lord jesus christ no wonder they are ashamed to quote it ashamed and they hide it accept it peter accept the truth i did that is why i left the watchtower there is no room for any doubt or any argument there can be no serious rebuttal by brooklyn none their claim is fatally impaled on the horns of their own words. Now, some of these points are made in great detail by Ron Fry in his book, The Christian Quest, and also in Ray Franz's masterful book, In Search of Christian Freedom, both of which I highly recommend. To sum this up, the Watchtower has sold a grand and fraudulent lie. The Watchtower is not what they claim to be. The Watchtower is a giant fraud. And sooner or later, the watchtower will answer to God for their false prophecies and for the way they have arrogantly and cruelly treated their brothers and sisters. They are responsible for uncounted blood transfusion deaths. They are responsible for stumbling hundreds of thousands who have left the watchtower with their face shattered, their outlook poisoned, and their families broken up. Have I said everything about the watchtower and Jehovah's Witnesses is wrong, corrupt, and rotten? Of course not. I know better and so do you. But their core claim to be God's only organization is totally bogus. From that claim comes the incredible power to control and punish in the name of Jehovah God. That cult-like claim causes sincere believers to live manipulated and stunted lives lacking Christian freedom and maturity. The Watchtower claim allows them to prophesy for God, and without a doubt they are now proven to be the false prophets. Their worldview is false, and countless lives have been cramped and deformed as a result. All this because of their that one terrible claim. I prepared this talk for the benefit of people who have left the Watchtower, but without having access to this information, have harbored a lingering question as to the possibility of the Watchtower being the approved organization of God. You know the truth now, and I hope that concern will never again come into your mind. Once that central truth about the Watchtower is cleared up, we can now re-examine all our beliefs and attitudes that had logically followed from that great and fundamental lie. We once reasoned that because the Watchtower is the one and only organization, all other organizations are wrong, and so we must avoid all connection and participation with them. Now we know absolutely that the Watchtower is not, cannot be, the one and only organization of God. Therefore, all other groups and organizations are not automatically wrong. So we must reconsider any involvement with them as we search for our meaning our purpose in life. As Christians, we have a responsibility to be a part of the kingdom yeast that works to turn the heart, the people of the world, to Christ and to his kingdom rule. It's like a new life. Take a new look at churches. Take a new look at the millions of people who work so hard to help the poor, the blind, and the sick. Consider a new attitude toward the people of the world of mankind. And please, a new attitude toward your life on this earth and remember if you only come halfway out of the watchtower that evil empire has still won it has neutralized you it has taken you out of christianity's wonderful work if your past experience has left you believing that there is no caring god that the bible is beyond understanding that life has no real meaning please know that i and others here at brci have been down that road too and we've come to some truly in inspiring news to share with you at another time. But for now, let these words of Jesus sink deep into your hearts. Come, he said, come to me. 
I will give you rest and refreshment, forgiveness, joy, purpose in living. Become a happy follower of Jesus Christ. In conclusion, if you as I have left the watchtower, the words of Deuteronomy 18 have special meaning for us. When a false prophet has been exposed and condemned by God, the Bible says, be not afraid, for sure. Be not afraid of the watchtower. But also, be not afraid of life, of living fully now. Be not afraid of the future, but rather joyfully releasing the past from your heart. Thank God. Thank Jesus Christ. You are free. You are at peace at last. Now I want to take another three minutes to read you an addendum to this that I think will prove interesting. It'll, it's an idea taken from Ray Franz's book, In Search of Christian Freedom, and it would be almost funny if it wasn't so powerful and so serious. I want to start with a quote from the Watchtower, November 15, 1980. Quote, The kingdom class under Jesus Christ is made up namely of 144,000 members. They're the anatypical Israelites, spiritual Israelites, who are in a new covenant with Jehovah God. Like the Israelites of Isaiah, of Isaiah's day, the spiritual Israelites sold themselves because of false practices and came into bondage to the world empire of false religion. That's to say Babylon the Great and to her worldly paramours. An outstanding instance of this occurred during World War I of 1914 through 1918. So much... And the quote, so much for the slaves' claim for faithfulness during that critical time that includes 1918 and 1919. Now I have two important questions for you. Number one, what were the things that enslaved the watchtower to satanic Babylon the Great in 1914 and 1918 and cause their unfaithfulness? And question number two, the critical question, were they free of these things or were they still enslaved to Babylon and still unfaithful to God in 1919, the final year of God's judgment of them? Joe, those witnesses in the divine purpose, page 91, answers question one. Listen, quote, they soon realized that they'd been held in spiritual bondage in many ways. There were many false doctrines and practices that had not yet been cleaned out. The brothers had been in Babylonish captivity at that time. They had accepted earthly political governments as the superior authorities that God had ordained according to Romans 13.1. And besides, there were many putting emphasis on so-called character development. And there was considerable creature worship in the organization. Furthermore, such pagan holidays as Christmas were being celebrated and even the symbol of the cross was used as a sign of, devo of Christian devotion. All of this is from page 91 of Jehovah's Witnesses and the Divine Purpose. And now question number two. Were they free of what they considered enslaving Babylonian con corruptions in 1919? And the answer is absolutely not. The truth is they were still enslaved, so they could never, absolutely never, have been judged worthy of God's blessing as the only true religion. A, because they were still enslaved by their so-called false interpretation of, of Romans 13, 1 and 2 until 1929, over 10 years after the window time of judgment closed in 1919. B, in 1919, their creature worship was actually at a peak regarding Pastor Russell. C, as to the cross, look at this picture. The watchtower had the cross in the upper left-hand corner on the cover of the watchtower, still yet in 1930. D, Christmas. Here's a picture of Christmas breakfast in 1926 at Bethel itself. The room is gaily decorated with Christmas decorations and each member, including Judge Rutherford, with their Christmas presents on the table. All of this is to prove that in 1919, by their own words, they were still enslaved to nothing less than what they believed was Babylon the Great. Therefore, it would be absolutely impossible for them to be judged worthy of receiving the greatest award in the history of Christianity in 1919. For a complete explanation of this idea, please read In Search of Christian Freedom by Raymond Franz, pages 145 to 51. The book is available at Commentary Press, Post Office Box 43, 532, Atlanta, Georgia, 30336. 
This truth finds and then hits and disintegrates the very foundation of the huge Watchtower organization. The Watchtower Society is not God's organization. It cannot be God's organization. And that, for that, we can thank God.